broadcasting live from Detroit, Michigan, and all around the world. The Church Militant is Mike. Here's your host, Michael Morris. Hello, everybody out there, and welcome to Mike Up from churchmilitant.tv, our internet radio offering we bring to you each week at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, did you hear that the, uh, the Vatican finally put the muzzle on cardinals sitting in front of uh, TV cameras in Rome, uh, just sort of waxing eloquent and uh, sort of uh, you got the impression the Vatican thought they're kind of blabbing off at the mouth a little too much, and said, that's it, and started sort of shutting down things in particular in particular, the folks that drew the, uh, it would appear, drew the Vatican's ire the most were the uh, American cardinals. Uh, in particular, uh, Cardinal Donald Worrell, uh, who, if you've seen any of the video of the interviews with him, uh, has been sitting there kind of just sort of, uh, you know, you look at it and go, what, what are you talking to the media about and for? And when they ask you a question, you answer, well, I can't really tell you that. So what are you sitting there for? And I think that there's a lot of people who are kind of upset. And by the way, Cardinal World is not the only one. Uh, but it seems, as a matter of fact, a number of people made the comment that uh, uh, Cardinal George, they would have expected a little bit more out of him as well. So the very fact that kind of the Americans come rolling into town and, you know, sit down and start talking to the press and almost none of the other cardinals from anywhere in the world were doing this. So what happened is all this press started coming over from the rest of the world and setting up their cameras and turning this into kind of a, a, a sort of impromptu media conference uh, with the American Cardinals, because they're the only ones that we're talking. So you've got not just American reporters there, but guys from Mexico and Brazil and Portugal and France. They're all sitting there because no one else uh, talked, or perhaps a better way to say it is every, most of the rest of the Cardinals have the good sense not to stand in front of the media and just sort of start blabbing off at the mouth. But uh, um, this, was, uh, this was the report from uh, the Vatican Information Services. We're going to read it to you here. Regarding the canceling of the press conferences that some of the American cardinals were giving in these days, Father Lombardi observed that, quote, the congregations are not a synod or a congress in which we try to report the most information possible, but a path toward arriving at the decision of electing the Roman pontiff. Uh, in Vatican speak, that's a smackdown. That means shut up and stop standing in front of the cameras and blabbing off at the mouth. Have some respect for your office. This is not a press conference. It continued, in, the sense, in this sense, the tradition of this path is one of reservation, meaning reserved and conservative and a little bit of posh, in order to safeguard the freedom of reflection on the part of each of the members of the College of Cardinals who has to make such an important decision. It does not surprise me, therefore, that along this path there were, at the beginning, moments of openness and communication, and that afterwards, in harmony with the rest of the college, it has been established whether and how to communicate. Uh, once again, that is Vatican speak for be quiet, walk away from the cameras, and have some dignity for your office. Um, it, is a, uh, uh, it is a kind of, uh, uh, you know, you look at it, you're kind of like, well, why are these cardinals sitting there talking about stuff? Aren't you supposed to be talking to each other? Uh, so... Uh, now, in fairness to them, Cardinal DiNardo of Houston said, well, this is just kind of how we do things in America. You know, we're very, uh, you know, we talk to the press and we give press conferences. Uh, so and maybe that's, uh, maybe it's just a cultural thing, but uh, it sure seems to have uh, uh, not ingratiated the American Cardinals with many of the rest of the Cardinals. However, there was one American Cardinal who would have nothing to do with this. As a matter of fact, he never even showed up at these sort of impromptu press gatherings and uh, tete-a-tetes, and that would be Raymond Cardinal Burke, Raymond Cardinal Leo Burke, who had great respect for the, has great respect for the office of cardinal, and most importantly, the function in which that College of Cardinals is now engaged. And I don't know if you saw this or not, but we'll get it and put it up on the, uh, we'll get it and put it up on the uh, video uh, replay if you want to see this, but there was a scene just before, I believe it was the day before, perhaps two days before the American, before all of the cardinals said goodbye to Pope Benedict while he was still in office and still in the Vatican. And there's a video, we, we watched it here in the studio, there's a video circulating around that, set, that showed all of the American cardinals, one by one, 
uh, cameras. It's a Vatican camera. It's planted on the side to get a side view. Each of the American cardinals uh, coming up one by one saying goodbye. A few of them, probably half of them, uh, kissed the Pope's ring or made sort of a slight bow or, you know, did a double hand handshake or something with him. Uh, but what is typical and what is protocol, particularly when you're, I mean, we do this when we meet bishops here. I mean, you're going to meet the Bishop of Rome. You'd think you'd kind of underline it even more that you kneel down uh, or at least become very low if kneeling is a problem for you and kiss his ring. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, of all of the American cardinals that came up to the Pope, only one actually knelt down and kissed the ring of the successor of St. Peter, and that would be Raymond Cardinal Burke again. So, um, you know, is there a little too much Americanism uh, going on uh, in the uh, American church, the church in America? Yeah, sure looks like it, doesn't it? Now, we've got a couple of things we want to get into here. Uh, uh, a little deeper. Just a sort of the la- that's the latest report from what's going on in Rome today. The American cardinals uh, got told to stop uh, hogging the limelight and kind of being uh, you know immature and uh, childish and sitting there giving press conferences when they should be devoting their time and their attention to uh, to the election and the discussions surrounding the election of the next pope. Quite the little uh, smackdown there. So I think any American cardinal, with the exception of Cardinal Burke. Uh, probably just may have had his chances blown a little bit there with that. Uh, didn't, the other Cardinals didn't take too well to that at all. Um, second point, many, many, many people in the media expected, you know, I should say this too before my producer yells at me, this is an open mic night, folks, so we're going to open up the lines for you, 646 200 646-200-0903, 646-200-0903. We are talking about the... Uh, conclave, the lead-up to the conclave, uh, and the uh, what the church needs in the uh, in the upcoming pope, new pope to soon be elected, uh, and welcoming your questions and comments. Six four six two hundred zero nine zero three should also tell you if you got the uh, if you have the link to the show. Uh, the chat room is open. I understand there's a lot of chatter in there already. And, uh, yep, getting a sign there. There's a lot of chatter in there already. If you're in the chat room, you want to ask a question, you can type the chat there. They'll send it out to me here in the studio. If you're, uh, if you're listening or if you're uh, doing anything on Twitter, send us a question on Twitter. We'll be happy to answer it. They'll just send it, copy it over and send it to me out here in the studio. So this is open mic night. We'll just keep telling you what's going on, and we'll take your questions as we go along. Is there a... Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm getting a, <laughs> just got a line here on my prompter from the control room that Cardinal Burke is on the line. Uh, I'm going to presume that's not true <laughs> because Cardinal Burke, I'm sure, is not up at two o'clock in the morning in Rome. Uh, we should say uh, uh, the second piece of news here is that journalists from all over the country, uh, the United States, and actually all over the world, uh, last week were saying, well, the Cardinals are going to meet on Monday absolutely, absolutely, by end of business on Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, they're going to have pl- selected a date for the conclave. Uh, wrong. No, they haven't. Now, the next time they will be meeting, will be meet- it will be Thursday morning in Rome, and they're still sitting there, having not selected a date to start the conclave. This is really quite a, uh, uh, this is really quite a turn of events. I mean, it's totally, absolutely, totally caught the uh, secular media off guard. They had no no idea whatsoever that that things would not be rolling along. Everybody said the conclave would begin on Monday. Heck, all the cardinals aren't even in Rome yet. I believe as of this point, there's still two missing, uh, and actually two of them are from Germany. Uh, so you know, they can't even have a conclave until they're all there. And just sort of out of out of a courtesy, they really wouldn't unless there's some emergency that we're not aware of and we haven't been told about. They're really not going to try to decide a date uh, without all of the uh, Cardinals present. That's just sort of, you know, good sport. So they're not going to do that. But it is very, uh, it's very telling that uh, they haven't done this. Now, a lot of the reports, an awful lot of the reports are saying that um, uh, the reason they haven't done this is because they really want to get to the bottom of what's going on. Look, there's this, there's this report that was released about the whole homosexual cabal that apparently is in the uh, operating in the Vatican, according to uh, Italian press reports. 
uh, that 300 page report, that three cardinals in particular who are all over 80 and therefore will not be voting in the conclave, uh, they put together over the course of almost the entire last year at the personal request of the Pope to get to the bottom of what's going on uh, with regard to the, uh, uh, the, the Vatty leak scandal, the papers being stolen off the Pope's desk and given to a journalist who published them in a book, all of the intrigue of you know, political power gathering and uh, you know, all of this. There's, as cardinals come to Rome, they look at the condition of the way the church is being run, and they're saying, hey guys, what's going on? We want to know what's going on. The Italian cardinals, many of whom are in the Curie, are like, let's get on to the conclave. Come on, let's get voting. Come on, nothing to see here, folks. Move along, move along. And many many of the rest of the world's cardinals are saying, oh, no, no, no. Hold on a second there, Luigi. Yeah, we want to know what's going on here. We want to understand what's going on. So we're going to take our sweet old time. We're not voting to have a conclave to rush this thing through. We're going to sit in here in these meetings that are called congregations, and we're going to talk and get to know each other and find out what's going on. Yeah, we want to have a pope quickly, but we don't want to have a decision that was made poorly. So good for them. Uh, What that means uh, is that there's an awful lot to talk about. Will there be? Will there be a conclave on Monday? Eh, There might be. Probably pretty unlikely, though. So now at this point, uh, the conclave date, let me check my calendar here, the conclave date would be uh, starting no uh, sooner than March 11th. That's Monday, perhaps March 12th. If we get into, I mean, according to uh, the, the prescripts of how this is done, there has to be a conclave starting uh, by the 15th, so that's a week from Friday. But uh, when this is going to happen is anybody's business. Now, we got a bunch of callers on the line. Just before we get to them, I want to give you the results of something that was really, really, really disturbing, and we're going to get on to this but, uh, uh, throughout the show because it's, you know, look, whenever a story comes up in the news about the Pope, you know, every news agency on earth runs out and does a poll. They do, they poll Catholics. They say, what do you do? What do you think of this? How wrong do you think the church is on contraception and abortion and same-sex marriage and euthanasia and embryonic stem cell research? And do you think there should be women priests and should priests be allowed to get married and blah, blah, blah. It's just, you know, it's probably just a reset button. They push send every time something big happens in the news. But, but, This particular poll that was taken as a combination of the New York Times and CBS News that was just released earlier today is shocking. It's shocking in what it's found because it made the distinction that many people in the church say the secular media never makes. They just go out and ask anybody who says they're Catholic, what do you think? And since most people are unfaithful Catholics and don't go to Mass every week, etc., well, then, you know, their answers get you know, poured into there, mixed in, and it makes it look like everybody who's Catholic believes this stuff. Well, this poll made the distinction this time. CBS News, New York Times made the distinction and went through this, and and they identify weekly mass goers, weekly mass goers, um, and they've got a number of results in the poll that are actually, uh, well, they're alarming, they're saddening, they're disturbing, but they are a clarion call if there ever was one. Again, folks, just to let you know the number to call in is 646 200 0903. 646 200 0903. I want to read you a little bit of the article from the New York Times. It says, quote, The sexual abuse of children by priests is the largest problem facing the church, Catholics in the polls said. Now, let's start with that. Sexual abuse of children by priests is the largest problem facing the church. Really? Really? That's an amazing thing. That is a media-driven perception because almost all of the sexual abuse cases were from 15 to 20 years ago and back further. So that's an interesting perception because that is a perception gleaned from the media. The amount of sexual abuse, as it says in a couple of other articles, if you read on this, that it has, there has been a drastic, drastic drop-off in the number of cases reported to uh, e- either the church or uh, law enforcement or both. This is a much bigger problem in other religions, in other walks of life, in other, uh, you know, like summer camp kind of things, uh, coaching kind of things. Heck, even the Boy Scouts had a major problem with this. So... It is the fact that the Catholic that Catholics in this poll say that that's the largest problem facing the church is shows you facing the Catholic Church shows you just how much that uh, Catholics are being led around by the media uh, by the perceptions given them by the media. Uh, 
Another very scary thing is that a majority, more than 50%, this is American Catholics, said they wanted the Pope to make the church's teachings more liberal, more liberal. And here comes the stuff that's really very disturbing. Even Catholics who frequently attend Mass, and that was defined in the poll as uh, weekly Mass goers, even Catholics who frequently attend Mass said they were not following the bishop's lead on issues that the church had recently invested much energy, money, and credibility in fighting, artificial birth control and same-sex marriage. They're simply ignoring the bishops on these things. They're ignoring church teaching, and they're ignoring the bishop's uh, uh, counsel, teaching, and guidance on all of these things. The article goes on, Benedict, a soft-spoken scholar and a church traditionalist, has apparently made, get this, little impression on American Catholics in his eight years as Pope. Asked whether the Pope is infallible when he teaches on matters of faith and morals, the article says morality and faith, but faith and morals, get this, 40% said yes, 46% said no. Almost half of American Catholics, and remember these are Catholics that are being, uh, that are being asked that are regular frequent mass attenders, are saying, no, the Pope is not infallible on matters of faith and morals, denying a dogma uh, uh, of the faith. On every other hotly debated issue, the article continues, Catholics wanted, want the next Pope to lead the church in an about-face. Seven of ten Catholics polled said the next Pope should let priests marry. That's not a dogma of the church, that's the discipline of the church. Let women become priests infallible teaching, and allow the use of artificial methods of birth control. Again, ordinary magisterial teaching, dogmatic teaching or doctrine. Nine of ten said they wanted the next pope to allow the use of condoms to prevent the spread of HIV and other diseases. And here is one that will really kind of knock your socks off. 62%, 62% of Catholics, two out of every three, were in favor of legalizing same-sex marriage. And the New York Times takes a little bit of glee here by saying Catholics approved of same-sex marriage at a higher rate than Americans as a whole, among whom 53% approved. So 10% more in the Catholic bloc, 10% more of, a Catholic, of Catholics agree with same-sex marriage then compared to the population, at general, only about half the population, slightly above half the population, uh, thinks that there should be same-sex marriage, according to this, this poll. Uh, but nearly two out of three Catholics think so. This is an epic failure, folks. This is an absolute epic failure of what has, uh, of what has transpired in the church in the United States. Um, it, it's, it's, it's very, very alarming, so alarming, in fact, that you look at this and you sort of have to push back and say, wow, how does the next pope even begin to deal with this sort of thing? Where do you, where do you start? Where do you start? It's like having an army in revolt. Where do you even begin? Do these Catholics who are saying, nah, the pope's not infallible, almost half of Catholics say the pope is not infallible on matters of faith and morals. Where do you start with those people? They're not all 12. I mean, most of these people are adults. So that, that, that they polled. As a matter of fact, all of them were adults. They're over 18 years old. Half your adult Catholic population sitting there in the pews doesn't believe the Pope is infallible on matters of faith and morals. So what are they sitting there for? Where do you begin if you're the Pope? Where do you begin if you're all these cardinals in Rome? I'll tell you where you don't begin is sitting in front of TV cameras giving press conferences. Uh, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to hit the phone lines. we get a few people lined up there. 646 200 646 200 0903 call in if you got a twitter then twit away <laughs> if you're facebooking facebook away and if you're in the chat room asking questions they'll all get out here to us we'll be right back right after this on church tv mic'd up catholics are born for combat and having the right ammunition to defend and learn the faith is easy just aim your browser at church tv Go to our login page and sign up by clicking on the premium member icon. Then you and your family can choose from hundreds of on-demand programs, all for about 33 cents a day. Become a premium member of churchmilitant.tv today. All right, everybody, we're back. Just before we go to the phone lines, I want to read you a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, comments. Uh, on uh, one of the blog pages uh, that people have uh, written in. They're actually, uh, they're, they're, 
they're humorous because they're expressed in a humorous fashion, but they're they're sad because of what they're about. But it's about the uh, American Cardinals sitting there, uh, you know, kind of in a somewhat immature, goofy fashion, giving press conferences and yucking it up with a journalist. Uh, here are some of the comments. Uh, they're acting like kids, very immature and also undermining the prayerful, serious attitude of the other cardinals. Another one says, perhaps here we have some men that actually would benefit from lectures on discretion. One guy said, oops, I should have made it more clear that you did mention all those names in your article, but that the two cardinals I referred to have been particularly talky. Those are American cardinals. Um, uh, the... Uh, 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 any cardinal who makes public statements, gives press conferences, or grants television interviews for whatever motives during the period before the conclave will not be elected pope. That is not my personal opinion. It is a fact. I suppose it's as good a way of any as avoiding election. And uh, <laughs> that's actually a very uh, very interesting point. You know, it's the cardinals who are always sitting out there in front, in front and center, and all that stuff who somehow seem to just disappear when it comes to, uh, when it comes time to the voting. We're going to go to the phone lines here and take a question. Our first one is from Joe. Joe's calling from Michigan. Joe, how you doing? I'm good. How are you, Mike? Doing well, Joe. What's uh what's up? What's going on? I was just wondering who your pick for the next pontiff would be. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to go out on a limb here and reveal a deep dark secret that I've never said to anybody before, uh, and that, uh, which that's not true. Uh, Cardinal Burke, uh, Cardinal Burke, hands down, not only do I know the, know the good Cardinal, his eminence, uh, you know, personally, and know that his heart and his mind and his intellect and his will and everything is absolutely devoted to the church and to our blessed Lord, but uh, I think he has all of those kind of intangible things that you need to be a leader. I mean, obviously, there's sort of a list of things that a good leader uh, needs, certainly, uh, but there's intangible things as well, just kind of an, you know, a vision, an ability to sort of see connections that other people don't see. I mean, all those things, I think he, uh, uh, I, I think he would be a tremendous, uh, a tremendous pope, and that's just kind of on the managerial side uh, of, the, of the job, which is part of the job, but on the spiritual side, the man is tremendously holy. He is at, now. He would. He'd probably hit me over the head if he heard me saying this. So I'm glad he's uh, you know a, a good ten hour plane plane ride away. Uh, but he's he's tremendously holy. When you're around him, you just sense that aura of holiness. And it's really funny when you talk to people who are in the presence of Mother Teresa and Blessed John Paul and uh, people of that stature. They said that even if you didn't see them come into the room, when they walked into the room. Uh, you had you could just feel like something happened in the atmosphere of the room uh, that you knew they were there. Uh, so uh, uh, I mean, he's got my money. I'm not going to stand here and do give me a B, give me a U, give me an R K E Burke. But you know, uh, I would, I would if it wouldn't be made fun of by people. Uh, <laughs> uh, who are you rooting for, Joe? B U R K E Burke. B U R K E Burke. I guess so. He sounds like a pretty good guy. He's, he's your man. If he can't do it, no one can. <laughs> no one can. <laughs> How much have you been following the uh, following news in all of this area, Joe? Just Fox Two when it's on. Well, are you uh, are you following anything on uh, in the social media world? Are you keeping keeping tabs on it at all? Not as much as I should be. All right. Well, you've recognized that, so now you can start following. And you're listening to us, so that's a good start. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, Joe, thanks very much. Stay listening. You'll learn something. <laughs> yes, sir. God bless. All right, God bless. Thanks, Joe. All right, we've got Dave from Oklahoma. Oklahoma's okay. Dave, how are you? Mike, how are you doing, sir? Doing well, doing well. You've uh, been following, keeping up with uh, what's going on with the uh, – uh, with with the conclave and the lead up to it, and all the news coming from Rome and all this stuff, uh, you keeping up with everything? Oh yeah, and the sheer disaster that it started out so far being with with uh, everything that's going on, and uh, so it's it's been an interesting process to watch all the leaks come out and the leaks be proven false and this that and the other. So 
I, I did appreciate the the uh, American Cardinals getting smacked down a little bit because <laughs> that was getting a tad bit ridiculous. Let me let me <laughs> let, let me ask you. What's uh, I mean, obviously we know your opinion now because you just shared it. But why? What, to, to elaborate a little bit more. What what do you think is wrong with Cardinals sitting there in this setting uh, having press conferences? Well, the the whole process is supposed to be one that's very contemplative and one that's quiet, prayerful. Um, and supposed to be secret, and to sit there and give press conferences like they're uh, like they're our president is, uh, is is kind of distasteful. You know, it uh, they shouldn't be talking about what's going on in the conclave. They should be sitting there and praying and trying to figure out who's going to be the best pope for the church. Uh, you know, right at this moment and and throughout the pontificate of the next pope. Do you think that there is uh, okay aside from sort of the the reflection that gives on the, 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 you know, kind of a lack of dignity or respect for the office, because, uh, you know, they're, they're merely the occupiers of the office. It's not them, it's the office they occupy. So I think that immediately kind of rubbed a lot of faithful Catholics the wrong way. But uh, do you also think that there is, uh, do, do you think that's reflective of a mindset of theirs? Yeah, it really doesn't show that they're open to the to listening to the way the Holy Spirit's going to guide them to a, a pope. I mean, it it really uh, they are they are shining examples of um, the warnings against Americanism that was in uh, Bene Valencia, right? I mean, it's, it shows the American hierarchy is is more concerned with image and less concerned with the faith. That's a pretty uh, that's a pretty declarative statement. <laughs> I'm not one that men's words, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think. Look, I think that's been a lot of. I think that's been an awful lot of. Uh, a lot of the. Uh, uh, what do you want to say? Sort of the the knock on the church, the the American hierarchy. They've always been. They, they, they've been so concerned for decades now. Not that. Not just this crowd, but many. Not again. We're not talking about all, but. You know, look, for the Cardinals, for the American Cardinals to go over to Rome, sort of roll into town, and then after a couple of days get smacked down by the Vatican and say, hey, guys, knock off the circus. You know, you're here to elect a pope, not have press conferences. That's a pretty telling thing. Yeah, well, and their track record by just the poll numbers you gave out shows the utter failure of the hierarchy in the United States to propagate the faith, defend the faith. It, it goes back to what you call the church of nice. Instead of offending anyone, I'm going to just kind of sweep those issues that are controversial under the rug, and people are led to hell because they think they're okay. You know, Father Nice or Bishop Nice is going to be sitting there and tell, not telling them what the faith is. And you have almost 50% that don't believe in the infallibility of the Pope. I mean, what are they? I mean, most Catholic churches are Episcopalian now. <laughs> yeah, that's actually that's actually a good point. I mean, look, if if you've got a crowd that half your people sitting in the pews don't believe in the infallibility of the Pope, as according to this CBS News New York Times uh, uh, poll today, and backed up by a Gallup poll as well, uh, they don't believe in the infallibility of the Pope. The vast majority disregard what the bishops tell them about uh, you know contraception and everything else, which is kind of amazing considering that I don't think I've ever heard a bishop come out and say anything about it anyway. Uh, at least you know not not in any sort of vast numbers. So I don't even know how they would know they're disagreeing with them because when have they ever said anything about it? But you get this, you get that. The gay marriage, two thirds, two thirds of American Catholics think gay marriage should be approved of, leading the pack for the whole rest of the country. We're slightly over half. I, I mean, the, you know. And they're sitting there having press conferences and yucking it up with the media. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It, it comes off as shallow, that these are not um, well-thought, well-educated, well-developed-in-the-faith people. It's, you know, image is everything, and, and substance, you know, takes a backseat to whatever the demands of the media and the image are at this particular yeah. moment. And it's, yeah. it's, it's a sad testimony as to what's going on here in, here in the U.S. and really probably all of Western civilization at this point, you know, U.S. and Christendom. I mean, that's, it's, it's pretty bad because Europe's not in any better shape. They're probably even yeah, worse than we really, are. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a sad state of affairs. Uh, Dave, we're going to uh, put you on mute for a second, but hang on as we're going to go to another caller here. Uh, we have a call from Canada, I believe. Uh, hello, is the Canadian there? I'm on the air. Great. Wonderful. Well, listen, what I want to say is this, is that those statistics that you read out, as depressing as they may be, 
the truth is that can be to our advantage in some degree because it could really uh, it really could really motivate some young men who hear such things and say to themselves, if there was ever a more nobler cause, I do not know one, than to get into the tussle and the bustle of re-evangelizing the faithful once again. I mean, those kind of numbers are terrible, and they are true. They, they are, those are not exaggerations. Any priest who's worth his salt knows it's true. And uh, it's, uh, as sad as it may be, it, it is uh, important for us to know that young men can be motivated in the face of a disaster, maybe even better than they can be in the face of prosperity. And I think that um, maybe we can see this maybe to uh, a possibility to summon the very best to say, come over and help us <laughs> because the church is, is hemorrhaging and uh, she has need of strong voices. She has need of, of uh, creative and uh, uh, strong responses. And she has need of saints yeah, who are able to, uh, to challenge this problem. I mean, if we put it all on the shoulders of one man, the Pope, I, I, I fear that, you know, that there is no man on the face of the earth who can possibly do this with one single uh, effort. I mean, certainly the Pope can do an awful lot in giving light and direction, but the truth of the matter is, is that each of us in our own place have bear a solemn responsibility for, for the judgment seat of God on how to help this situation. And I mean, what you're doing is, is incredibly important. I mean, alerting people and giving people a formation and instruction. But admittedly, each of us have, you know, we've got a, we've got a momentous uh, task ahead of us and, and it just in a catastrophic situation. And it's true. I mean, sometimes crisis is sometimes the best incubator for heroism. And, well, you know, it's and, funny as uh, in, in human um, history. Uh, Ron Ema Rahm Emanuel said back during the uh, the financial crisis a couple years ago, the uh, when he was chief of staff for uh, uh, Obama, he said, "Nope, never let a good crisis go to waste." Uh, <laughs> does that uh, does that sort of sum up your view uh, here in regard to all of this? Well, I think I think yes. I think there is a situation that we could say that. Uh, this is, as Father Rutler used to say, this is the crisis of the saints. Um, and and uh, each of us have this huge task to somehow or another uh, re retake uh, enemy territory. And uh, a big shout out to you for going into the Internet, doing this kind of work, because if there was ever enemy territory, it's there. <laughs> and you're doing a, a magnificent work by getting into that. And giving people instruction and giving them formation. I mean, you know, I, I can imagine that, you know, many people don't have this kind of clarity on any given Sunday. They don't get the opportunity to hear instruction this clear. And so it's a very uh, precious grace for the church that there are people doing things like this in a capacity that their their talents are best utilized in and I think it's very important that this kind of work continue. Well, let me ask. So well, let me ask you. Well, let me ask you if I can. Uh, I'm going to keep you on the line for a second because this is these are some uh, these are some tracks and thoughts we haven't talked about yet today. I want to explore them a little bit more. What can for a you know a 16, 18, 24, 26 year old young man? Let's start with the young man. What could he do right now when you're saying, like, you know, come to the aid of the church? And that sounds very crusadery and, you know, sort of romantic, get in there with your sword and all that. But in the day-to-day, -day, what, what would he do? What are some things he Well, the he first thing he's at? got to do is he's got to know the faith. So he's got to go to places and persons who are reliable and completely 100% orthodox, that they're not, you know, watering down the faith, you know, uh, you know, being conscious of, you know, little niches in the church and making little categories up and stuff like that. Get away from those organizations. Move into the full mainstream of the church, which is the saints. Get to know the scriptures. Learn the saints. Learn the doctrines of the faith. Learn them inside. Learn them outside. Get involved in networking with other like-minded young faithful Catholics go to Eucharistic adoration, um, go to daily mass, uh, 
work on your spiritual strengthening of your will. And all of that is essential. You know, find a good, solid Orthodox priest to whom you can make as your regular confessor and go to spiritual direction. All those things, building, 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 makes you into a formidable leader wherever you are. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that, that's what the crisis of the church is. Right now we're suffering the loss of a pope. But what we're really suffering is the loss of leadership everywhere throughout the church. We're lost, we've lost fathers of families from being heads, of, spiritual heads of the family. We suffer from priests lacking clarity and direction in their own pastoral ministry. We, we suffer, you know, um, the movie star syndrome, even amongst the highest prelates of the church. We are suffering a great loss of leadership. Everyone must realize that leadership consists in knowing who you are and what you are about and living in accordance with that dignity. And that comes from our knowledge of the Catholic faith. So a young 16-year-old guy needs to reach out and find people such as yourself and be able to get in touch with people like you who can give clear, solid doctrine. And then the world's their oyster. Because truthfully, the whole world is looking for a leader. (laughs) It's not for nothing that, you know, 5,000 journalists have rushed to Rome, you know, when they, when, you know, the media has declared the Catholic Church but a relic. Um, It's not for nothing that they're rushing there because what they're really expressing is this inward reality of a leaderless age, you know. I mean, everyone's singing, you know, the Furino dirges over the loss of Chavez in Venezuela. And you say to yourself, the world. So, what are these words? He's a dictator. I mean, he's no, he's no leader. He's a despot. But that's how out of, out, of, out of our minds we are looking for leaders. We're willing to take anything. And even if it's a dictator, we're willing to think that that's something, you know. Well, and we took Obama. Me for, and you're Obama. I mean, I'm a Canadian just watching you poor soul self-destruct. But you know, there's, a, there's a loss of leaders, of true, authentic leaders. And young men especially, I would say that what you are saying in all of these statistics, it, it, is, it, is a, it, is a, it is a dreadful set of numbers. But those are the kinds of truths that a young man, when hearing it, says to himself, what shall I do to help the Holy Church? I think it's very important that what you are saying is very important. And a young man must sit down and, uh, you know, draw up a list of things he must do. And I think it's very important for him to put it all in an email and send it to you and say, Michael Boris, what must I do? <laughs> That's right, because I don't get enough emails, so that'll be, uh, that'll be helpful. No, if anybody's listening, if, any, if anybody's listening to this gentleman's advice, uh, we are happy to get your emails here. We get loads of emails every day, a few hundred come in here every day, uh, so we are, uh, you know, it might take us a little bit of time to get back to you, but we are more than happy to get your emails, and uh, so if you want to uh, underscore, he wants more advice. You got some particulars of your circumstances? Please feel free to contact us. We'll do our best to, uh, you know, to talk with you and you know get back with you somehow, some way. Uh, let me ask you also now. Okay, so that's the advice for uh, young guys. What about uh, young ladies in the same, you know, ruffle, you know, roughly the same age group, sixteen to maybe twenty-six or so, that sort of ten-year, you know, gap where many people. And we're concentrating on that because many people in that age group. Really still, you know, that's kind of that age in your life where you're not necessarily committed to one thing or another yet. Just certain areas of your life may be coming into focus or certain paths. But many people still at that age haven't committed and said, well, this is what I'm doing and this is where I'm going and I'm absolutely doing this. It's a lot of people, particularly today uh, in contemporary times. So uh, we've talked about young guys. What about young girls? Well, there was a very interesting interview on Saturday night on another blog talk radio show called Forward Boldly, uh, an interview with Alice von, Dr. Alice von Hildebrand, and she had said a very interesting thing about women. And she said, women have been given by God a gift of influence. And I thought that was such a wonderful way of describing it. Can, can, you, re- can you repeat that again, the, your, the phone cut out for a second? What did she say? She had said that God had given to women – a great gift in that they have the power of influence. And I think that any of us who are, are men, we know how influential our own mothers were 
in our own lives, and, and certainly uh, women, by their very their very genius, have within them that technique of being able to persuade, not necessarily with words, but even just even say with body language, they are able to move the conversation. What I think is that for young women need also they need a solid formation. They need to be able to separate emotion from uh, the, the world of feeling from that it, which is true. And they have to be able to have good, solid spiritual formation in that regard and intellectual formation. Uh, St. Edith Stein was a big believer in this. She was uh, convinced that unless women wrestled free from their kind of, um, the, you know, the, the the fallenness of, you know, allowing their emotions to get ahead of them, that they would be, you know, enslaved by their emotions. So she was convinced that they needed a strong, rigorous philosophical, intellectual formation. So a young woman should not be, you know, sitting back and just letting the world dictate to her that she must become a feminist. But she must take what is best in her, and that is this insatiable appetite to know, because women love to know things, they must take that insatiable appetite and apply it to the faith and to the spiritual life. And then again, just like a young man, network. Find those organizations that are existing in the church, those little grains of salt that are sprouting up everywhere, and connect and get involved. And again, I mean, I I don't know if necessarily, you know, there is a a place for every single one of these, you know, young people that is within driving distance, but it's so important to have a community of support because if you're all by yourself, Boy, it's it's very hard, and and I think you know one of the glories of the Latin Mass and the revival of the ancient Mass is that it's giving young people who are often all by themselves, you know, struck out, you know, they they've read themselves into the church, they've read themselves to a higher understanding lacking, of what the but church is. But they're lacking is. the community. Yeah, they're all by themselves, and then they find the Latin Mass, and they find this built-in network of people where they go, wow. Wow, and and I have to say, it is so ingenious on the part of Benedict to have released this valve in the life of the church that it's an it's an inevitable movement, and I believe that the new pope that's going to come along is going to actually even foster it further. I think he's going to understand because the work of the Holy Spirit is here now that the remnant of these young people who are faithful and true. They're going to need that network, and they're going to need it bigger and broader all around the world. And uh, I just think that that's that's an incredible thing too to be really. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't seem like it would make much sense that uh, uh, because I I I personally believe that the uh, Samorum Pontificum, the the you know sort of re-engaged or released freed uh, the traditional Latin Mass. I don't believe that was uh, just sort of some happenstance thing. I think it was under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't seem logical uh, on the part of the Holy Spirit to do that for five or six years and then all of a sudden shut it off again. So I, I agree with you. I think the next pope is going to, if anything, he's going to further that more. Uh, you know, and I, don't, I think its pace will pick up uh, in the next pontificate. Uh, you know, as you look through all of these, uh, as you look through all of the various uh, uh, um, uh, list of uh, people that are the men who are being considered uh, what keeps jumping out at you is that a lot of these names are kind of the high-profile names. And, you know, there's even a, a betting pool in London. Uh, they've set up odds makers. Uh, they've set up odds makers on them, and it's very, uh, it, it, uh, you know, there's different, it's like going betting on, you know, who's going to win the, uh, who's going to win March Madness as the NCAA tournament begins. And they've got odds on this cardinal and that cardinal. And, you know, just, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. They have no idea what they're talking about because the men who are going to do the electing don't know yet. They haven't even sorted out amongst themselves. Heck, they're not all even there yet. So uh, I think, you know, we've got to put this, not that what we think has any influence at all one way or the other, but it does kind of prepare the groundwork a little bit. It, It tills the ground that if somebody walks out there onto that loggia, 
uh, as the white smoke is going up and people don't recognize, well, we never heard anything about him, uh, the first reaction is to think, oh, this is some compromise candidate or it's something they all didn't, you know, most of them didn't, you know, uh, you know want to vote for him to begin with. So there's something wrong with him. We don't have to listen to him. He's a transition pope. He's too old. He's too young. And there's all these different things that the media will spin on it. So in advance, we need to know uh, when if someone walks out there who is not expected or not in all of this constant secular media chit chat, uh, when they start their spin, and it will start, uh, you ignore it because there are no favorites and there are no this one's expected. They're not expected because the very people who set the expectation, the Cardinals themselves, haven't set that expectation even amongst themselves yet. So how could the media know? The media is just going, making stuff up because, look, there's 5,000 guys in Rome sitting there writing stories, and they have nothing to write about because there's no conclave set. they got nothing to do. I'm a reporter. I'm a reporter from 20 years ago. I, from, you know, I, I was a reporter, TV reporter and producer for 20 years. When you get sent to something like this, we used to get sent to the, the uh, uh, elections, the, uh, uh, you know, the conventions, Democratic and Republican conventions. If you rolled into town a day early, you had to file a report. I had to file a report back with the station, back with the network. But if there was nothing going on, what did you talk about? Well, you all sat around with each other, you talked, and you came up with stories by talking to each other, and then you went on the air and reported them like they were some kind of facts, when in fact they weren't at all. So uh, when somebody steps out on that loggia who has not been mentioned much here in the secular media in these lead-up days and these run-up days to the conclave, do not buy their party line then the same way you shouldn't buy their party line now. Now I want to go back to something we were talking about here at the beginning of the show, uh, which was a little um, uh, was a little uh, uh, disconcerting. And go back to this um, uh, th- this poll from CBS News and New York Times. Uh, I'm going to quote from the article in the New York Times again. It said Catholics seemed to feel far more warmly toward their local priests than those in the hierarchy. Get this number. Seven in ten Catholics in the poll said they felt that their parish priests were in touch, quote, in touch with the needs of Catholics today. Uh, So uh, that's a good thing. Uh, 85% of those who attend Mass said the sermons were excellent or good. Well, okay, let's let's look into this for a second. That 70% felt that their priests are in touch with the needs of Catholics today. Well, that's a little odd, considering that ca- most of the Catholics today feel like uh, they they support abortion, same-sex marriage, divorce and remarried Catholics, contraception, on and on. So that is kind of a thinly veiled, almost damning statement of the local parish clergy. In touch with is kind of a, you know, a colloquialism for saying somebody agrees with me. Oh, yeah, he's in touch with me. He understands my needs. He knows what I need. And therefore, dot, 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 gives me what I want, tells me what I want to hear. That's backed up by the next statement. 85% of those who attend Mass said the sermons were excellent or good. Are you kidding me? Excellent or good? Most of the sermons would couldn't rouse the dead. They couldn't rouse... You, they're... Talk about total buzzkills. All they say is, love each other, God is love, give a dollar to some." They don't talk about anything substantial whatsoever. 85% of those who attend Mass said the sermons were excellent or good. Bishop Sheen gives good sermons. Uh, you know, the Curie of ours gave good sermons. Father Nice down at the Church of St. Mary Happy Face does not give an excellent sermon or anything of the kind. They talk about things that make people feel warm and fuzzy because that's all they want to do, that's all they want to hear, and so they walk out going, oh, that was a really good sermon, Father. Really, if those were so excellent, they're so excellent, then they should be able to remember what was said. Anybody listening to the show, go up and ask somebody who goes to a, a, a typical Catholic parish, a typical parish in the, in the United States, go and ask uh, uh, any one of your friends who goes there to tell you what the last sermon was about. They'll look at you with a blank face. So much for all of their excellent sermons and their excellent homilies. Uh, people don't remember these things at all. They don't even remember them on the way out the door. There's an old joke about, uh, uh, there's an old joke uh, that, thank God, uh, 
uh, that God gave us such limited memories so that we would forget almost every homily or sermon that we'd ever heard. Um, uh, so anyway, I think that's an, and it's an interesting thing that, that their Catholics are out of touch, feel like the hierarchy is out of touch with them, uh, but that most of their priests are in touch with them and that their homilies are good and excellent. Please. It said, when asked which one thing they would, quote, most like to see the next pope accomplish, the most common response that was volunteered, or that were volunteered, were in their order, number one, bring people back to the church, number one, number two, modernize the church, number three, unify the church, and number four, do something about sexual abuse. That's a... Uh, that's a very, uh, we'll go over those once again, as I've got them in writing in front of me. If you're listening on the air, you don't. Four most important things they want to see get done. Uh, most like to see the next pope accomplish. Number one, bring people back to the church. Number two, modernize the church. Let's stop with those two right there. Bring people back to the church that would be modernized. What's the point? Why would you bring people, why do you care if people come back to a church that accepts abortion, uh, accepts same-sex marriage, accepts contraception, accepts divorce and remarriage, accepts cohabitation? Why do you have to go to church? Why do you have to go to church to get any of that? Just stay outside of the church. What are you trying to bring people back into the church for? Why do people, why do so many Catholics have this idea that the church is just some sort of social club and we all come to it and hang out together and we have some sort of personality identification that, oh yeah, we're Catholic, but we have no idea what that means and we think that all of these things can be changed. What is the, This just goes to show how incredibly dumb most Catholics in the United States are that a majority of Catholics consider that the most important thing is to bring people back to a modernized church and to unify that church. Unify it around what? The democratic principle of whatever you want to believe is, is you know, my own personal freedom and liberty. This is, a, this is insane. This isn't a Catholic church anymore. I mean, this is not a Catholic church the way we understand it anymore. There is an operating schism inside the church. And the vast majority of people are on the wrong side of that schism. Modernize the church. Make it all, make it what? How much more modernized could you get? The churches, most of them look like firehouses. The priests are either gay or, or you know, uh, you know, tired and give ridiculous homilies and nobody pays attention to what they're saying. And this isn't a church. This isn't a church at all. It's, it's a crumbling down edifice of what once used to be something majestic. The church in America looks like Berlin in May of 1945. And, of course, there's always that omnipresent, make sure we do something about sexual abuse. Haven't we done something about sexual abuse? Haven't we? I, 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 you know, how many priests have been, innocent priests, have been sort of caught up in this dragnet of being accused falsely uh, by somebody? Yeah, there's, of course there's been a lot of sexual abuse, but now if a priest just says hello to somebody who's under 18 walking down the street, all of a sudden they're, you know, they're a predator and they're a criminal and they're wrongly accused and they're shipped off to some psycho ward somewhere. And uh, not particularly because many in the hierarchy care about what the, uh, uh, you know, care about the victim, but they want to make sure that if a lawsuit comes, hey, they want to make sure they don't have to pay out millions and millions. Look, we did everything we could. We did everything we could. That attitude is prevalent in the church today. What else more could you do about sexual abuse or alleged cases of sexual abuse? You kick them out, and this happens to innocent guys. You kick them out, uh, you, you marginalize them if they're let back into any kind of uh, practice. And again, these are the innocent guys just the falsely accused guys, they get raked over the coals, marginalized by their own clergy, nobody wants to, their own brother clergy, nobody wants anything to do with them, they don't want to have anything rub off on them. I mean, that's how far the church has gone in America, the hierarchy has gone. If there is even the hint of anything, then bam, that poor man, if he's innocent, is essentially delivered over to the lions. So when people say, well, we want them to do something more about sexual abuse, I'm not sure what else you could do more about sexual abuse. Again, that's a media perception. So as you look on this list, bring people back to the church, modernize the church, unify the church, and do something about sexual abuse. With the exception of the first one, bring people back to the church, every, every one of those other three, modernize it, unify it, and sexual abuse, those are all media-driven media perceptions. No one in the church 
uh, even under, even uh, lay people even understand what they mean by that. Modernize the church. We, what you want to make abortion more available? Again, why do you have to come to church? Why do you have to come to church for this? Why do you have to uh, have the church's blessing on all of this stuff? You want to go marry your 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 uh, your uh, high school teammate from football? Well, go marry him. You don't need the church to bless this and say it's okay. Uh, unify the church again. Unify the church around what? around uh, around dissent, around heresy, around heterodoxy. It's insane. All of this, all of this it bespeaks the massive failure on the part of bishops, priests, religious orders across the board for the last 40 or 50 years. And I had a young man, I'll wrap up with this, we've got about 45 seconds left. Uh, he's talking to a young man the other night who was saying, uh, in some sort of, I don't know, halcyon-induced coma that the church is growing by leaps and bounds, that hundreds of millions of people are joining it. Really? 2,000 parishes have been closed in the United States alone, alone in the last 20 years, 1,300 of them in the last 10 years. That does not t- speak of a church growing by hundreds of millions. That speaks of a church shrinking rapidly because it has let the modernist mindset take control. That's all we've got for right now, folks. We're just getting ready to sign off. I want to thank you for joining. Again, our apologies to everybody who was lined up in queue there talking, the the, the blog talk. You know, if you can contact them and say your your material is horrible, we'd love it. God bless y'all. Church Militant, mic'd up. God bless you, and hopefully vote for Pope Burke.